morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people all over the world um, working with animals using applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement. We empower people that want to empower animals, and we will help you do that through our live streaming services. And you can find out more about what we do on our website, which is theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, all of our services are there, are listed at the top. Um, and then you can also contact me via our email, laura at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. So uh, we've been live streaming Coffee with the Critters every Sunday morning uh, for over five years now. Uh, we turned five years old in March. And um, if we don't live stream on a Sunday morning, we will give advance notice and we do a co cocktails with the critters usually on Saturday nights. Those are few and far between. And usually when I want to sleep in on a Sunday or I'm traveling, which is not happening right now. <laughs> so um, good morning, Sheila. Good morning, Susie, Julie, Melissa, Daniela. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope everybody is doing well. We have a guest on with us today. So I want to get through um, a couple of photos, just um, telling people more information about us and recapping the past week. And then I will bring Michelle on. So for all of our events, um, looks like people are starting to go back to work. States are opening up and going back to work. Um, I do have some travel plans, but they're kind of all on hold right now. But if um, for future events where workshops we have here, workshops we give across the United States or different presentations I'm giving, you can always find it here in the events section on our Facebook page. Uh, for those of you that follow the work that we do or want to know more about the work we do, you can always join our email newsletter list, which is located right there on our Facebook page. Um, those of you that may not be familiar, good morning, everybody. Got a full house this morning. Um, may not be familiar with our work, and we're going to talk about this with Michelle. Um, all of our, a lot of our, 90% of our services are live stream services. We have our level one, which is for people with companion animals, Level two is more for uh, professional animal trainers or board certified behavior analysts, uh, zookeepers, people who want to get want more information in the field of applied behavior analysis and working with animals. Uh, we also have species specific, such as the Parrot Project, which we are approaching 200 members, um, the Pig, Pro Pig Project, and that's a few of the services we offer. So good morning, everybody. Hey, Sylvia and Shelly and Joe is here from the UK. Um, we've live streamed a couple times with Jim Gillis over in the UK, professional dog trainer. Good morning, Therese. Um, okay, this past week, real quick recap. Um, our center is opening back up. We've had volunteers coming in for the past two weeks. Um, and it's been such a stress reliever for me. Um, so toys are being made for all the resident animals. Um, cages are getting cleaned again on a regular basis and not at 11 o'clock at night. Um, this past week, Rico, um, one of our <clears throat> umbrella cockatoos turned sweet 16. Um, so hopefully we have another 50 years together. Imagine, imagine having a companion animal for 50, 60, 70 years. Welcome to companion parrots. Make sure it's what you want. Um, so we did a celebration here where we, um, we did a live stream on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page where we blew bubbles for all the animals and absolutely nobody liked them. <laughs> so it was not a great birthday present. Um, something else that happened this week, um, a lot of people helped me with this. Um, at one of the zoos I work for, good morning, Chantel. Good morning, Mark. For uh, one of the zoos I work for, um, we designed a custom cage for two hyacinth macaws that were supposed to come to the zoo, but then the pandemic hit. 
Um, so they arrived this week and this is that beautiful cage, which is, uh, I think it's 16 feet long. And as soon as this live streams over, I'm headed to the zoo, um, to get these birds out in the sunshine. So here are the two hyacinths that came in this week. Um, they have no names yet. Um, they came to us from Southern Florida, just above the keys. Um, Fabulous birds, um, very well taken care of to this point. Um, so we'll be live streaming the, the, my training with them where you, it's a luxury for me if I can train an animal from a very young age. Usually I don't have that luxury. Um, people contact me, unfortunately, after behavior issues have been very well practiced for a couple years <laughs> so then there's a lot of counter conditioning to do so we're live streaming every single step of the way where to begin with a young bird um, and how to prepare them for success um, so something else that is new which is a lot of you know that i collaborate with the autism model school um, they have asked, we have a, a, a program where we collaborate together, talking about um, in providing enrichment. A lot of the students come here, uh, pick up toy parts, take them back to the classroom and make them. And part of their job skills is to bring it back and deliver to the animals. Um, Due to the pandemic and kids being out of school early, we've collaborated together on animal enrichment and I live stream for them now in their classroom, well, in their classes at home um, every week. So they posted this on their page last week and it's just, it makes me feel good to see the animals that I care for on other businesses, Facebook pages and people's Facebook pages. So it's let me do know. We are doing our job. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on Michelle, um, but pay attention to the end of the live stream. I have an announcement to make, um, but for now, let's bring on Michelle. She'll be coming in here in three, two, one. Hello, Michelle. Hi, good morning. Hello. How are yeah. you? Um, so I haven't met Michelle until about um, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> we did a test live stream. Mm -hmm to make sure this is working. So it's nice to finally meet you. Yeah, and, nice to meet you too. Yeah, I know um, we we have known each other on social media or followed each other or been in touch with each other. Am I safe in saying a couple years? Yeah, yeah, I would say probably two or three years now. Okay, yeah. So um, I first noticed you a feed popped up or something and I saw you training and whenever I see somebody training something, you know, I'm always skeptical. What kind of training are you doing <laughs> and how are you doing it? And I remember jumping on your page um, because um, your website is essentialanimaltraining.com. Right. I remember going to your website and looking through and watching what type of training you were doing. And I saw you were doing positive reinforcement training. So I, liked and I started following and that's when I started seeing different posts of yours <clears throat> pop up and um, um, sorry somebody made a comment as saying hi Michelle it's yeah, Sylvia. Hi, Sylvia. yeah okay I okay, good good um, <clears throat> so um, I started following your work and then I noticed you had a lemur in your logo, correct? Yes, a lemur yeah. and a fox. Mm -hmm. A lemur and a fox, yeah. Um, and you train a wide variety of animals. You've been a dog groomer for, is it over 20 years? Over 20 years, yeah, about 24 years now. And you still groom? Well, yes. not right now. <laughs> yeah, no, not, not, not right now, but yeah. we're, um, things are opening up here. So we are getting back to work. Good, good. Yeah, we are too as well. Um, we're not fully opened up, but we're majority opened up. Um, so 
tell me uh, how did you get into animal training and why do you train the way you do? Oh, um, well, <laughs> Loaded I question, one and two. <laughs> was a little burnt out on the grooming and I was looking for something to kind of breathe life into my business. Um, so I, I came across the Animal Behavior College, um, which does uh, distance learning. So I took a dog training course through them and um, became completely obsessed. I uh, learned about positive reinforcement and it just, it made total sense to me. I, it's something that I had always been doing. I just didn't know that I was what I was doing. You know, I had no name for it and I wasn't um, applying it uh, specifically. So I, from, I completed the course, um, got my dog training certificate and, um, and then just started from there. I just started devouring every possible information I could about training and behavior and started working with some clients training dogs. And I think um, Animal Behavior College is one of the schools that uses some of my videos for their training. I don't know if um, Sean Whaley's on here, but I believe she went to, she took courses through them as well. Okay. Uh, so you're, you're, I'm not really thoroughly familiar with them. Um, this, this was about five or six years ago. They've, they've changed a bit since I went. Um, it was a very basic introductory course. Um, not something that the average person can go out and start training animals after doing. Um, but it was, it was a nice foundation. It got me started. Um, and, and really pushed me in the direction of positive reinforcement training. Is there application? Do you have to submit work? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so you, you actually, at the end of the course you do, I believe it's a 12 week um, mentorship type of thing where you actually go and, um, and attend, work with some a local trainer for about 12 weeks. So somebody, so they have um, trainers, what, all over the United States, and yeah. then they pick, okay. Well, hello, I'm in Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, their focus is dogs. I don't know that they do okay. training of anything anything else. Um, they so, should. Yeah, they should, yes. Because a lot of times, um, this is why I do what I do, Um I will train dogs, but I prefer to train exotics and I prefer to train <laughs> yep, uh, yeah. for numerous reasons. And let's talk about that. Let's make sure that's another thing we talk about because um, you can really fine tune your skills through um, training outside of species you're familiar with. Absolutely. Yeah. Because like I know we'll talk about um, primates and birds, but <laughs> if you don't know, because I, this is where it's really important to treat each animal as its own individual, because if you don't know, what does this mean? What does this mean when a, when a baboon does this to you, you know, you find that out through training safely off contact. Hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Otherwise you might learn the hard way and yeah. Nobody wants that. <laughs> right, right. So sorry, um, I took a, took you, your conversation off track. So you went to Animal Behavior College. Yep, and uh, learned about training dogs. And the rest I, I kind of stumbled into accidentally. Um, so I, from the dog training, I had a, a dog trainer friend who had a couple of Mustangs and one of her mustangs was um was still unmanageable untouchable um she couldn't couldn't really be handled so um we kind of got together and said well let's try some positive reinforcement and i went out with the horse um i had a, a lot a lot of experience with horses from when i was younger so um very comfortable with them so i went out with the horse and i started working with her and um and found that that um that i was actually a lot better um training horses than training dogs um it was definitely more my my forte so i worked with Something her you preferred. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely preferred. Definitely um, was seemed more at home, more comfortable with it. Um, and uh, so I started from there. I started working mostly specifically with mustangs. Um, I do really well with with animals that are fearful, um, and so feral anything um, is is kind of my my niche. So I worked with mustangs for a while, and I I ended up owning a, a Mustang who was um, very, very psychologically damaged when I, <clears throat> when I uh, started working with him and I ended up adopting him. And I was driving out to see him one day and looked over and there was a zebra in a pasture um, on the way to him. So of course I stopped because, oh my gosh, a zebra and knocked on the owner's door and you know so sorry i'm knocking on your door but you must get this all the time and um she she basically just kind of sent me back and said you know go ahead go back there you can see the zebra but she's not friendly she's not you can't touch her she's she'll she's afraid she'll run away and I uh <laughs> and you got the picture on your personal <laughs> Facebook page. Yes. I I jumped on that and was like, well, I might be able to help you with that. And um and she said, go for it, do whatever you want. So <clears throat> I started working with the zebra. I was working with her for a little over two years, I think. And um, yeah, and then I, she had a lot of other exotics, so that's kind of what what got me into working with with did exotics. You, so did you start training? all of her animals oh yeah oh yeah everything yeah foxes lemurs uh camel the zebra a bunch of different kind of um bovine yeah everything a little antelope she had porcupine um african porcupine yeah she had everything there so you're in florida <clears throat> yes. so your state tends to have more um exotics because of your weather is that yeah. correct yeah, yeah, I would I would say one of the reasons. Um, it's it's also very open here. You can own just about anything with the right permits. Yeah, whereas if you were driving down the road here and somebody had a zebra in your pasture, you'd guarantee you there'd be a car accident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a common sight. Yeah, um, yeah so, okay. Um, in all of this has happened over the past, since the past five years? Five years, yeah, five, six years now. Okay. Yeah. I want to talk to you. There's three different things I want to make sure we talk about. Um, why Why do you prefer to train exotics? Ooh, um, I'm not sure, <laughs> actually. Um, I worked with dogs for a really long time, so I was really kind of burnt out on that. Um, so you used to train dogs? Yeah, it's well grooming dogs. Um, kind of, you know, I just I was kind of over the whole dog thing. Besides, there's there's so many um, dog trainers out there, amazing dog trainers that, um, you know, that that are helping people already with dogs. Um, exotics I found were a, a different kind of challenge. Um, I I like the the challenge of of helping people develop a relationship with an animal that you wouldn't normally think of as, um, as a pet or as an animal that you could have a relationship with. Um, and frankly, there's, there's really almost nobody helping, um, exotic pet owners. Um, you know, there's plenty of trainers that work in zoos and, and different facilities, but, um, but the pet industry is, is basically unknown and, and, uh, and these people are kind of, they're, they're just, they're oh, out there, they're pets. And when they have behavior problems, they just kind of deal with it. Um, so it's, it's rewarding to be able to, to help pet owners specifically be able to develop relationships with these animals that they've chosen to own, um, that they have no idea you know there's there's no information out there at all there's a complete disconnect between the zoos and the pet industry as far as training so you prefer to work with exotic pet owners yes okay um 
don't get me wrong, I'd never turn down a zoo if they said, hey, can you come and help us with this? I'd be all for it. But, sure. um, but yeah, I, I really like working with individuals. I like working with, with people individually, with their horses and exotics specifically, and, and seeing that relationship develop. I prefer to work with exotics as well for numerous different reasons. Um, I like working with the undomesticated. Um, because I'd say the primary reason why I do what I do is I like to empower animals. I like to um, give them choice um, and in, in increase the enrichment in their environment through training. Not only training, but um, studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it's the animal's preferred form of enrichment and right. it shows, yes. you know, the proof oh, yeah. in the pudding. <clears throat> um, I also, I mean, I have a lot of friends that are fabulous dog trainers and several are on here. Um, I like to use my work to back up what they're saying because a lot of times in, in the dog and domestic animal community, you can use a lot of force. Um, right. Dogs tend to be very forgiving. Some of them. Um, <clears throat> So I like to back up, you know, and I've had people ask me, well, why do I need to do positive reinforcement training? Because it takes so long and I can just force this animal to do this. And I was just like, <laughs> okay, the proof is in the pudding. Right. Um, is what's going to happen with that behavior when that animal gets rehomed somewhere else? Um, or what ha is going? what is that behavior going to look like in six months? Where is that animal going to be in six yeah. months? It's, it's an interesting thought process because, yes, in some cases it might take longer initially, but once you have that um, and you've trained that behavior, um, then you 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 know forevermore you have an animal who's cooperating with whatever you want them to do, and and you can get it done easily. Whereas if yes. you force them you are now stuck with um, forevermore having to force them each and every time that you are going to do that. Um, and in six months, that force may have had to increase exponentially. Right. right. Um, this isn't why I use positive reinforcement, but it sure helps is um, I don't want to work that hard. Yeah. In my feelings. Exactly. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm not going to run that fast to chase uh -huh. you. I'm not going to get out that 30 foot ladder to get you out of the rafters. Um, in a lot of the animals I train and you as well, you use force with them maybe once, um, but you can get hurt if not killed. Oh yeah. Yeah. So like, for example, with these two hyacinth macaws, um, somebody asked how old they were. They're eight months old. And um, they're at a zoo here locally that I work with. And I told everybody, I said, please don't ever force these birds to do anything. Um, they're, they're young, playful, very innocent. When you pick them up, they'll, they're fully flighted. They'll use their mouth as a third hand. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a beak that has 300 pounds per square inch. Do not teach them how to use that any other way yeah. than giving kisses or taking treats from your hand. Right, right. <laughs> and I just asked all the zookeepers, I just said, these guys can become a lot of work in another six months if we teach them any other way. Don't ever force them to pick up, pick right. them up, do anything. Um, Let's avoid creating behavior problems that we yes. don't want in the future. Yeah. Yeah. We have a fresh, young, innocent mind ready to explore the world. Let's, right. let's teach them how to do that safely and for us to be together. They'll probably outlive me at this point because they're only eight months <laughs> old. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, um, a couple other things I wanted to talk to you about. You told me a little bit in the test, you will train anything except, hey, Diane, you will train anything except what? Birds and primates. And why is that? Um, birds, I 
to have very, very little experience with. Um, I'm, I have found that I'm not very good at reading their, um, their body language. It's not an animal I've been around, um, very much. So, um, I prefer since I have, if, if I didn't have people to refer, um, bird clients out to, I would, I would of course probably take them on and, and wing it and kind of figure it out as I go. Um, but since I do have um, other professionals like yourself who are much more familiar with birds, um, I prefer to refer people to um, to the people who have more experience with that with that particular species. I think it's I think it's better to know your limitations um, to adequately help people. It's it's better for me and better for my clients to focus on the animals that I do um, that I do feel comfortable with and that I'm, I'm more familiar with and can read and understand. And that's very honest and responsible of you. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. I may stand corrected. Shelly Hotstetler says, hi, high sense have a beak strength of 1200 pounds per square inch. Where am I getting 300? Um, Either way, I do not want to get bit by one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Regardless, I don't even want to get bit by anything. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so why not primates? I, don't <sighs> felt like, I once felt like that as well. I was like, so I, I absolutely love lemurs. Mm -hmm. I will work with lemurs. They are the one primate that I'm very comfortable with for, I have no idea why. Um, I really like them and I um, do well with them. Um, primates in general, um, I have a little bit of difficulty reading them. Um, and I know this is so awful to say, but primates are kind of like the worst of people without any of the good <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. It's just like yeah. um, I, I have been around a few, um, a couple of capuchins, um, owl monkeys, uh, marmosets. Um, I think I've been bitten by all of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I just mm, if if someone comes to me with one of these animals and they need help, um, I would probably take them on simply because there really isn't a whole lot of options of um, of well, people who are using actual positive reinforcement to train them. Um, but my preference would be um, to be able to refer them out to, to somebody who maybe specializes. Um, well, um, I work with a lot of primates at the zoo, a lot. Okay. So if you're looking for somebody to refer out as far as primates, I'd be happy to help them. Okay. <laughs> That's good um, to know. Yeah. The, the pet industry, um, when it comes to primates, especially the, the pet industry, um, it's very, very different from, from the zoo um, in the way that they handle and, and keep the animals and their approach to behavior. So it's a it's a little bit complicated. It's kind of a, a, a huge mental shift for owners to um, to let go of the things that, of course, we see with all species, the dominance and the need to control them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we're a state where I don't think it's legal to have primates as pets. We used to. Um, we're in Ohio. Um, so. I know when I'm asked to train a primate, I will ask what the behavior issue is. I will ask every primate I've ever trained has been in a zoo. So um, there's, and I do tell the story of one, and I have them in one of my webinars called Off Contact Training. Um, it was Micaiah, a pigtailed macaque that I still see all the time. And yeah, I tell people the more intelligent the animal, the harder it is to keep and care for. And that is. That's very true. That is the parrot. That is the primate. You know, in a lot of zoos, the it seems like a lot of the number one, from what I see, where animals are lacking in people training them, understanding them, and adequate enrichment is 
parents. Yeah. A lot of parents. Um, and primates and bears. But um, yeah, I tell people the more intelligent the animal, the harder it is to keep. But with Micaiah, the pigtailed macaque, um, I got contacted about him and I, I knew him. I saw him. I didn't know him. I didn't know him. That's why I didn't want to train him because I didn't know him. But um, he scared me. Yeah. He scared me and I didn't understand him. And same thing with one of the baboons that I started training in level two. Uh, but what, so with Micaiah, in the beginning, I could have easily said, and I told him, I was like, please don't make me train this. <laughs> I do not want to train this mechanic. But because he scared me and he scared me because I didn't know him. I didn't understand him. So I started training him and him and I now have a relationship that is nothing short of amazing. Some of the people that have come here um, and did the zoo workshop uh, with me this past September actually cried when they saw some of the things that had happened between us. Okay. Um, and I started understanding him through training. I got, I, I learned real quick what that meant. You don't want to see that, <laughs> you know what I mean? but this is a cue for what's going to happen next. So I'd rather much pay attention to when this happens. I, I'm just like, well, sorry, I'll back off. I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then how my, my experience with, with all of the exotics that I've trained, because of course I never had contact with any of these animals beforehand, the zebra, nothing. Um, so it was kind of jump in and just hang out with the animal and, and, you know, reinforce things that I liked. And I kind of figured the animal would tell me what I needed to know about them and I would learn. Um, so now I know a lot about uh, zebra behavior, fox behavior, you know, all these different animals, just because I, I just, I kind of let the animals tell me about themselves. Through the training. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah through just interacting with them, hanging out with them, observing and, and yeah, training. Um, yeah. So what is it? Cause you and I got in a conversation here. I think it's when Dylan pickles first came here, yeah. we were going back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. and what is it about lemurs that you love? Oof. Um, maybe it's because I, I, was kind of thrown in with a, with a lemur, the, the, the lemur actually in my, um, in my logo. Um, so Charlie, I met him. Uh, he was I'm trying to think maybe eight months old. Um, when I met him, he lived out where the zebra, um, lived. So I started of course, hanging out with him and training him. Um, very, very interesting animals. Um, they're kind of all over the place. Um, as fast. I'm sure you know, yes, very fast and jump from here to here and just kind of craziness. Um, but yeah, he's really sweet. I, I, uh, I really liked hanging out and working with him and, um, they're a little more, I, I think it's probably the face that makes the difference for me. Um, most primates have a more uh, almost human-like face and the lemurs definitely have more of a animal-like face. So an animal -like yeah, face. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a little bit different. Um, so that's probably why I've, I've never really thought about why I like lemurs so much, but that's probably it just because I had such uh, you know, close relationship with a, with one that was very, it was young. Um, and I just, so I was able to kind of hang out with him as he developed and matured and, you know, yeah. developed a relationship with him. Yeah. I, I have never really want to say I've been a lemur fan. Um, but obviously I am yeah. a, little bit, <laughs> a little bit now and we have Dylan Pickles here now. Um, Dylan Pickles are, I can't remember, three years old now, three, two and three. Yeah, um, Dylan Pickles were, I think I asked you this before, they were mother raised, yes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And... Um, there's another baby at the zoo 
that is mother raised. And um, I was watching, the zoo is open now. So I was watching from a distance and the parents, you can, I don't even want to touch them. I want to stay <laughs> far away from them. But it's really interesting to see that the offspring the offspring that they produce and their offspring are very curious mm -hmm. um, with, with people. And right. I saw them, I saw this, that's just reminded me, I was like watching these three lemurs in an exhibit last week. And I saw the young one keep going up as close as it could get to the people. And I was <laughs> like, note to self, start training that lemur. Yes, yes definitely. Yeah. yeah, we're doing a, I mean, we're in, in like Dylan Pickles, they're young, two and three years old. And um, they're so, they crave the training. Um, and when I met them, it was at a zoo and I was just walking by to train something else. And they were following me and I was just like, hey, I saw motivation. Um, yeah. So I started training and here we are a year later, they're at the center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now it's interesting that you have two two male lemurs. Are they they intact? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's very interesting that you have two male lemurs over the age of two, and they have not become uh, aggressive. aggressive. Yeah. In the pet industry, um, it's basically a given, um, just known fact that. Once your lemur, male lemur, or any lemur hits um, two years old, that they become aggressive. Um, I have my own opinions on that, but it is a very, very popular idea, and you know, just it's just accepted as the norm that once they hit two years old, they're going to become aggressive. You told me that, and um, the zoo told me that too. That lemurs okay. over two um, get aggressive, stop dealing with them. I was just like, well, how old is Dylan Pickles? <laughs> you know, so that made me, okay, let's talk about labels. I don't care what the animal, because I think you, this is where you and I were going in the conversation that we were having uh, privately. Um, you told me that, and I was like, that's the second time I've heard this. Okay. So what, what I start to question then is how are people handling them? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so pet in the pet industry, lemurs are pulled within the first few weeks of being born. They're pulled from their mothers and um, sent to their pet, you know, their new owners. Um, and they are then bottle fed. Um, and this is, the idea behind this is so that the animal will bond with the human. Kind of like the birds. And yes, um, so uh, this Does that backfire in my opinion. Yes. I mean, it's hard to say because, again, there's really nobody doing what um, what we're doing. Um, so it's it's really hard to say. Um, so in, in my opinion, I think that these animals are um, not only are most of them not being raised with um, with positive reinforcement, but they're also not learning those important social skills from um, fight inhibition <laughs> from their parents and siblings. Yeah. So, um, yeah, um, that w that's popular in the bird world and hopefully that's changing. Um, I gave a presentation in Utah to about 200 dog trainers and one of my comments was in the bird community and I don't want to offend anybody um, in the bird community, eggs are pulled. So the chicks right. don't even see their parents. Right. And I said in the dog community, if you did that, you'd be crucified. Yes. Yes. So then these birds are raised not knowing essential skills for their future that nobody can teach them better than their parents. Right. You know, and then in two years you've got hell on your hands mm -hmm. and the animal loses its home. Right. And the shelters continue to fill. Yes. And this is exactly what's happening with uh, lemurs. Um, I, 
foxes, every domestic that I've, um, I'm exotic pet that I've come across, this is what's happening, um, is the, the animal matures. Um, they have no social skills, species specific social skills. Um, they've been raised by humans uh, with a, a mix, uh, you know, a jumbled mess of, of, punishment or and the, and the humans probably anthropomorphizing and oh it's my baby well, yes, no. yes especially with with primates and and you know the similar animals yeah they're they're dressed up treated like dolls treated like half surrogate children and half doll yeah it's yeah so it 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 does uh tend to cause problems as the as the animal matures especially when they reach sexual maturity and the hormones start to play a role and and uh, you know natural instinct kicks in uh what they should be doing um if they were in the wild and uh you know they're in someone's home being dressed up like a doll so <laughs> yes do you remember that case here in ohio um ohio used used to be one of the uh um worst states in the United States for owning and owning exotic animals. You could have a tiger yeah. in your backyard. Uh, we could have everything it's just yeah. like here. Yeah. But um, it's not like that anymore. Um, and I think uh, what put an end to that was um, the Zanesville. Do you remember that? This was probably like seven years ago, Zanesville, Ohio. Um, a guy had all these tigers, elephants. I can't yeah. remember all of them. Um, in his backyard and um, he was not mentally sound and he ended up releasing them all and killing himself. So right. people had baboons running through their backyard. If you know baboons, yeah, no. I'd rather have an alligator in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oof. Yeah, that, that, that's scary. Yeah. Um, Diane, Garrett and Shelly are having a conversation off off to the side. I'm seeing this. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, Shelly's in level two. We did a book review on that, how to build, how to tame a fox and build a dog. I believe it was what it was called. Didn't care for that, um, title, but the book was fabulous. Um, Nancy Forrester is on here. Yes. Um, so yeah, what I was saying, do you remember the case of the chimpanzee? here in Ohio, where the woman was dressing the, was it a chimp? I believe it was, as a baby and it wore a diaper and it slept in bed with her and it ended up destroying her best friend's face. Yes, uh, yeah. yeah. And unfortunately that is a very, very common occurrence in uh, the, the pet industry, um, especially with the primates, um, people, they, they do, they wear diapers, they dress them up, the animals sleep with them. It's, it's, again, it's, it's like a strange kind of half surrogate child, half doll. Um, the only thing that they don't treat them like is the animal that they are. Right. So, yeah, very complicated. Right. And then, um, speaking of anthropomorphism, putting human characteristics and traits on non-human animals right um you you see a chimpanzee walking down the street with a diaper on holding the person's hand mm -hmm. um what kind of message does that send to another person right oh yeah sweetie go ahead and go go ahead and pet the monkey yes i'd be like sweetheart get in the back of the car right? <laughs> <Hide. laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so um thank you nancy um, let's talk about, you and I had this conversation off screen right before this live stream started. Um, I, about live streaming our training, doing our training via live streams because mm -hmm. we both do. And you said you prefer to do it. Why? Absolutely. hundred percent. Um, so why? There's a few, a number of different reasons. Um, the biggest reason is that when I first started training and I was very involved in, in the training and working with the animals, um, I found that it, it, it became kind of complicated in that um, the animals would focus on me and they would do everything for me. Um, 
and the owners, they kind of, because they already had a history with that animal, um, with other, um, you know, other methods of handling, not just positive reinforcement. Um, the animals already had a background with them. Whereas me, I was coming in and the only history they had with me was positive reinforcement right from the get go. Um, so a lot of times I would get a, a real shift of focus on me and it was like the aunt, the poor owners didn't exist. Yeah. Um, great for my ego, <laughs> but not, um, not real conducive to the whole purpose that I'm there. It so is, virtual, it sorry. It frustrates the owner. Yes. Yeah. It does. Yes. The owner thinks I can't do this. I don't have what it takes to do this. The owners, the response that I would get is, well, my animal likes you and they don't like me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And that's, um, definitely not, not the goal. So virtual training, um, uh, live streaming video calls allows me to coach the person with their animals. Um, and they get to build that relationship, um, with their animal. So it removes me entirely from, from the equation. Um, and the, the owner gets to experience all of the steps of um, shifting their animals focus to them and building that relationship. Um, and I get to watch, you know, I get to watch this unfold. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, Tracy, yeah. Has a question. we'll address that in a second. Go ahead. The other reason is that um, a lot of the animals I work with is I'm sure, you know, with exotics, um, some of them are really fearful. Um, and their owners can't get, can't even, you know, can't get near them, can't do anything with them. Um, so adding another person to the mix, um, the time it would take for me to develop a relationship with that animal and draw them out and get them to be, um, to be able to um, communicate and interact with us, um, it's, it's much easier for me to just coach the owner in building that without um, without putting more fear and anxiety on the animal by adding that extra person in into the equation. So those are probably the two main reasons why I like it better. It is um, so effective. Yes, it is, it is. It's so effective. Um, and I think before the pandemic, people weren't seeing how effective it was. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, very to do. Although I, it, it's interesting. My, my equine clients, um, jump all over the, the virtual training. Um, they're, I've never had pushback for that. Um, the exotics, the same, they're, they're on board when I can, you know, get people interested in training their animals. It's, it's, they're fine with the virtual. Um, it's the dog clients that I get a lot of pushback from They're um, they're not so, you know, they're, they're very questioning of well, how does this work? work and yeah, is yeah. It effective and, but I get a lot more compliance from people when I do the virtual because they're so much more involved. Yeah. I think um, maybe a difference we're seeing in not getting pushed back from the exotic, but getting pushed back from um, the domestic is um the people that have the exotics, it's comp, it's, it's complicated. I, I need help. I need some serious help. And, um, I like the, uh, not that the dogs aren't, that's not what I'm saying. What am I trying to say? Um, they know behavior concerns are intense, um, yes. extremely dangerous. Right. Yep. Um, and, they don't have as much help. Yeah. As people with exactly. that they do. Yeah. Uh, we had, we just had somebody join our level one membership with the dog and it was here in Toledo, Ohio. And she wanted to bring her dog in. And I said, I'd prefer to just meet you online. And we did everybody in level one sat there and watched it. Um, working with her dog was afraid to go into the kitchen and mm -hmm. eat. So we shaped that behavior and pretty much shaped it all um, in that hour live stream. But with a lot of the animals you and I are working with, fear is very common. Yes. And behaviors labeled as aggressive out of fear is very common. Yeah. And we walk into your house 
environmental event, major environmental event just happened. A lot of times to the point where the animal doesn't give the behavior because it's not comfortable because it's some, something new. Oh yeah. So where you're sitting there doing a live stream and you're watching the animal not be like right there, that, that reinforced. Exactly. exactly. Yes. I, yeah. I, I recently worked with a little fennec fox that um, the owner had, he he was completely unapproachable, um, hiding. I mean, I couldn't even really see him in the video. Um, he was just hiding in the in the back of his cage. Um, and if I had been there, um, we would have gotten nowhere. I mean, she you know she had had this animal for a while, for a few months, and she was getting nowhere. So if I had been there, um, it would have been ten times worse for him. The anxiety of just having her in the room was already so extreme that he was stuffed into the back corner of his cage. Um, so if I had been there, it, you know, we, we would have gotten absolutely nowhere with the, with the training. So being as I could work with her virtually um, and just instruct her on what to do, um, it, it was a, it was a pretty fast turnaround. Um, we, we did one session and within a week she was sending me video of him coming out into the living room on his own. So. That's fabulous. And um, have do you offer any type of online memberships? Um, I I do actually. I have two different ones now. Um, one for equine, um, any any kind of equids, so horses, donkeys, mules, zebras, um, cows, sheep, you know, farm animal type, um, and another for exotic um, exotic pets. Okay. Okay. Um, that's. That's when I, where do I start with this? Um, when I first started doing virtual consultations, mm -hmm. um, they're not cheap, you right. know, and it's also a way to weed out who's serious and who's not. Yes. Because some people would pay me and just never show up for the consultation. And that was so <laughs> frustrating, okay. you know, because I'm like, I'm here to help you. I want to help you. But one consultation, I told them I, I will not sell one consultation. Mm -hmm. You have to buy a package because one consultation, you're going to get excited. You're going to see things start to work. And then, boom, I'm not there for any type of follow-up. Yeah. So then I started selling packages of four, consultations of four. That was $450. And that's a lot of money. Yeah. you know. And then people wanted more than four. and then. Now you've just paid me close to a thousand dollars. So that's why I started the memberships. So where I'll do a consultation, but then you have to join the membership and I have you all year long. Yeah. And if you do not participate, I will tag you. Yeah. <laughs> I will put you down and find out how you're doing. Um, because that animal is going to pay the price if not. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I do find the, the, the membership it's um, I I've just started mine. So they're a little slow to get going. Um, but I do like that because it does keep you in, in constant contact with the, with the pet owners and, and they get to, you know, you can, you can circle around and, and like you said, tag them if you haven't heard from them in a while and make sure they're still on track. It's yeah. And, and it's a little more cost effective for people too. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I, I get more um, coaching from that. So if somebody is in the membership and they're kind of going through and following along on the material that I have there, um, I'll oftentimes they're, you know, that it's, it creates that same excitement and they, they are kind of, you know, they, they want more and then I'll, they'll contact me for, for live stream. Their positive reinforcer is seeing it work, yes. seeing the behavior change. Right. Right. And then so that's when the coaching ends up coming into play because then they want, you know, they want more. They're, they're maybe, they're getting some results, but they want to see a bigger, uh, a, you know, bigger push forward. And so they'll contact me for coaching. This is fabulous. This is fabulous. Um, so didn't you put me in touch with somebody or with Kinkajous? Um, yeah. So I um, am the director of training and, and uh, management for um, Kinkatopia, which is a um, Kinkajou sanctuary. 
um, right it's actually right here in Boca so it's it's um, close right close to me and uh, there's there's about eight eight kinkashus there now um, so I, I uh, help with training them and and um, we've uh, really upped the enrichment that they that they have now from when I started there I've gotten um, gotten the owner to to really provide a lot more enrichment for them and we do some training with them just make it make it easier just to um, move them around or you know get them into crates if they have to go to the vet that sort of thing um, so so nothing too specific but just kind of ease of management is is really the focus there okay um, I see Sam is on here. She's a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst, and she asks a fabulous question. I'm not sure it's for you or for me, but maybe we can both address it. Is okay, it's not all going to show up, so I'm going to have to read it to you. Is there a certain threshold or marker that you look for behaviorally that triggers the consideration? Oh, it just moved of adjunctive pharmaco pharma pharmacotherapy. Um, for animals exhibiting extreme fear responses <clears throat> that prohibit learning? That's a tough one. Um, with dogs, yes. Yeah, you know, with, with dogs, there's definitely, uh, for some of them, if, if you're, you know, if, if, if I'm, so if I'm working with a dog and I feel like they're just, they're not progressing after two or three sessions, like we've made absolutely zero progress in, in overcoming their fear, um, that's probably when I, I start talking about um, looking into medication to help. Um, sometimes earlier, it just, it really depends. Um, unfortunately, with, with some of the other animals that I work with, the exotics, um, it's, it isn't, a, a, it isn't that easy. It's not that simple because um, the, all of the drugs that we use for dogs, um, they're, they're not necessarily safe for some of these other species. Um, so it's, it's hard enough to get people to, with exotic pets to even um, try out training. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I could convince any of them to actually uh, medicate their, their animal to help with that. Um, and I'm not sure what medications actually exist for some of, some of these animals that you could use. Some of them are kind of scary. Yeah. Um, we were just having this conversation. Where was it? Oh. I was actually having this conversation with somebody in a um, zookeeping Facebook page. Um, I work with a lot of different species of animals. And very few times have I had to consider medication. Mm. Um, and Sam, to answer your question from my work, Karen, if you're watching this, I just unarmed everything. You can come in. <laughs> um, very few times. Like I will try, I get a read on behavior. Do I understand what I'm saying and what I'm seeing? And if this behavior is so intense, like serious, abnormal, repetitive behaviors that um, any types of stress, the, the animal starts rocking its head, can't focus, um, learning, isn't happening or it's I'm having such a hard time just trying to get through to find a place to begin. Um, I was just having this conversation. We have an animal here where I think it would be easy to medicate to start training. And um, it, we've had animals here that before I knew any different were medicated with Haldol. Um, and, and I just had a problem with that. And I was just like, to give an animal Haldol to be able to put up with me living in the same house, yeah. that's when the training began. You know what I mean? No medication, no medication was needed. I did it the first time because I didn't know better. Um, but it really bothered me. And then I looked into what Haldol does, and then I talked to a few people that have been 
non hell doll. And I was just like, oh, hell no. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Um, it's like I work cuisine. It's another one that I, I absolutely, even for grooming, if, if people talk about, you know, medication to help the dogs through grooming and I, I, there's a few that I'm willing to work on the dog if they're medicated, but not with ACE. Never. Yeah. Um, Haldol and Prozac are popular. Yeah. Um, and neither one of them I would want to give. Right. Um, but would I consider, and I can't tell you enough. If you need medical advice, see a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. If you need behavior advice, see a behavior specialist. Right. Your animal's future depends on it. Yes. And so does yours. Um, I have found where I used something else, it was, it's not a medication. And it was advised to me, I work very close with a lot of veterinarians um, who respect the work that I do. And when I identify when there's a behavior issue, go see Lara. Uh, this is a behavior issue. And, I, and those are the vets that I choose to work very closely with. Yeah. Um, because they respect the work that, they, that I do and they understand the work that I do. They know the right. importance of the work I do. Um, where I've had, and this was a veterinarian that s suggested this, and I was like, that's interesting. And it, was, it, it wasn't a medication. And I did try it to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. and, and I implemented it a few times just to get the training started. But as soon as I did, boom, it was dropped out of the equation very quickly. Right, right. yeah. So, I, I do believe some medications can be beneficial um, in that, you know, just, just to take the edge off. I mean, if, it, you know, if, if you're limited on how much space you have to work with the animal, how, how far away from, from you, you can allow them to be. And it's just the situation is just not um, conducive to, uh, to, to training in the, the, the extreme anxiety, the state of anxiety the animal's in. Um, sometimes it, you know, it, it is beneficial to have something to kind of take the edge off a little bit, help them relax a little bit. Um, so they can focus. So they can focus, yes. Yeah, so they can focus and they can begin to learn. Um, but once you have that, once you have that connection with them, um, then yeah, then you're, you know, there's really no need to continue the medication. There shouldn't be, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have two podcasts out on pharmacology and behavior work. Um, so this has been a great conversation. Um, Sam says, Great advice to refer to the appropriate specialist example veterinarian. I love working with responsible prescribers and developing that reciprocal relationship. Absolutely. Sam, kudos. Um, and we that focus on behavior, we see it, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah. Um, so this has been a fabulous conversation, Michelle. It's been fabulous fi finally meeting you. And, um, likewise. likewise. It's, yeah, I'm really glad we were able to get together. Now that I know you're in Boca, the next time I come to Florida and in your area, um, I'm definitely going to reach out to you. Maybe we can get together and do some training and have some coffee and do great. some more training. That would be great. <laughs> that would be fabulous. So um, I have an announcement to make once um, I'm done posting Michelle's contact information. So Michelle, there's two ways to reach you. Well, two that I'm going to post, <laughs> um, but then will you tell us about your, how people can reach you? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I can be found on essential uh, animal training.com. That's my website. Um, and you can pretty much find all of my other links through the website. Um, I can also be reached by email at uh, martia at essentialanimaltraining.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, Insta Instagram, um, both of those at Essential Animal Training as well.
Great. And maybe there's some way um, we can, like I've got an idea for um, maybe doing some kind of project together in our level two membership or anywhere. If there's anything I can, maybe we can do something together there. Well, that would be fabulous. I'd love that. Yeah. Let's give that some thought. Um, there has been a lot of conversation happening on the side. Um, there's my good friend Nancy. I'm trying Ford. to skip over it as we go here. What's that? <laughs> trying to yeah. I'm kind of trying to read read over some of it as we're as we're talking. Just and, yeah, there's been some great conversations happening on the side. Um, and feel free to go back. Like as soon as I end this, I go back and respond to things. And uh, okay. Michelle, feel free to do that as well. Um, Coffee with the Critters is always such a treat. Thank you. Great conversation, informative and fun. I have been here alone for a long time. This is good socialization. Nancy, I'm coming down to see you <clears throat> down in Key West. Um, I just told my sister the other day, I, she didn't think we go to Key West. We're planning to go to Key West again in February. She's like, Laura, I don't think we're going to be able to make it. And I just told her yesterday, this, that was like a month or two ago. I told her yesterday, I said, I'm going to Key West. I would love to have you come with me. <laughs> Um, I've been worried about Nancy down there. So I want to make an announcement and then Michelle, when I hit end, unfortunately it's going to, it's going to end. So I want to say, oh, fine. I can't thank you enough for coming on here. Maybe we can, maybe you can come on again. We can have a different, another conversation. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is a, this is a lot of fun. It's, it's great to be able to talk to other professionals and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to mention was um, this is my favorite band in the whole world. Okay. <laughs> which happens to be in Key West, which happens, they happen to love Nancy Forrester. Um, I first saw them play at Salute on the beach. Um, and I was sitting at a table with Nancy Forrester and about two or three other birds, a couple different people. Um, this is, um, I don't know where this is going to, this is going to be a live stream happening this Friday night. Um, this is my favorite band, Billy the Squid and the Sea Cow Drifters. Um, it's like a rockabilly band. They are fun. They sing a lot of Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash is my favorite singer. This Friday night at 6 PM, you can go to this event, Billy the Squid, um, live stream show. Join me cause I will be there in the live stream at uh, six o'clock on Friday night. And this is a fundraiser for my awesome friend, Nancy Forrester of Nancy Forrester's Secret Garden in Key West, Florida. Mm -hmm. Nancy survives off of, um, and all her birds survive off of donations given um, in the tourism that goes through Key West. She takes in a lot of, um, unwanted parrots and with this tourism not happening, mm. Nancy is seriously struggling. So uh, we raised $2,500 for her in February for my birthday through the Sam I Can Foundation. And Nancy came on and said, thank you, Sam, for paying the, the lights, the electricity. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that Sam, let me say this, it's the first time I have rung his bell. So join me Friday night in the live stream, um, with Billy the Squid and the Sea Cow Drifters. Okay. So with that being said, we're going to, we're going to have fun. I'm going to be on there. I'm going to pour myself a scotch and um, listen to the music. So um, with that being said, I'm not gonna go through everything I was gonna post on here that most people know about. Um, Michelle, thank you so much. It has been um, a real pleasure getting to know you um, virtually. And I look forward to um, seeing you, having a conversation with you and working with you. Very good. Sounds great. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more of this type of thing. Great. Great. Okay. With that being said, thank you everybody. Um, and Michelle and I will jump on the live stream after it's over and answer any questions that we haven't addressed.
Okay. All right. See you guys. Thank you, Michelle. Bye. Thank Talk you. To you soon.